Hi, thanks for joining us for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Honeybees are great until they get into your house. Today we're going to talk about what to do. Also, everyone wants free stuff. Get free fertilizer with composting. That's just ahead on The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is David Glover, it's the David, it's the Bartley B. Whisperer, and Mike Larravee will be joining us later. Mike is the Compost Fairy. All right, so Mr. David, let's talk a little bit about bee removal. Okay. What are the steps that we need to know? Well, first off, there's a difference between bees and wasps. Okay. okay. And a lot of people can't tell the difference. In fact, some of the pest control companies don't know the difference. And so it's important to educate. Google knows a lot of things. So if you've <laughs> right. got something, look it up, go to the images, go to pictures, and you can see there's a distinct difference between yellow jackets, wasps, hornets, and honeybees. Yeah. Best bet, if it's black and yellow, mm. It's not a honeybee. It's not a honeybee. Honeybees are orange, brown, black, little muted colors. Bright yellow, yellow jackets. Mm -hmm. That's the first step. We need to know that they are indeed honeybees because if they're honeybees, I can deal with them. If they're yellow jackets, wasps, hornets, that's your pest control company. Right. Yeah, you don't want to deal with those, right? No. <laughs> the second step is we do an evaluation. We come to your home to see what's going on. And sometimes there still are yellow jackets. Oh. So uh, I'll, I'll tell them what to do. But the, the next step is to do a thermal image of the house, to look where they're seeing their bees. And we can actually see the hive in the walls behind bricks. Uh, that is just a first step because okay. the bees incubate the, the brood about 94 degrees, 95 degrees. And that's what we see, but we don't see honey. Okay. The wax and the honey, they keep it cool. So I could have two cubic feet of bee space and then 20 feet of honey. So that gives us a starting place. And then we have to determine if we're gonna do this through the walls from the inside or the outside. About 90% of the hives we remove from homes are in the ceiling joists. They come from the outside of the house and they just go right across the joists as far as they can. Mm -hmm. And those we end up doing from the inside. Walls, sheetrock is a whole lot easier to repair than brick. Mm -hmm. But sure. recently had to do a, a brick job where we had to remove the bricks to get the bees out. The, the hive was below the foundation of the house. Wow. The facade, the brick facade, was where they were coming in. And because the bees had been sprayed by a pest control mm -hmm. company, they were trying to get a new exit from the house. And they see light, inside light is the same as the sun. And so they're coming in around the window into the bedroom. When we remove the bees, we cut out all the comb. The brood comb goes into a hive box. Honeycomb goes into a bucket. And there's going to be trash comb. There's going to be comb that's empty, doesn't have anything in it. Or there'll be leavings where we're cutting the brood to fit into a high frame. And those go into a trash bucket. Wow. The big thing for us is to save the brood. The brood is the babies, that's mm -hmm. the eggs, the larvae, and the potential adult bees. Okay. And to find the queen. Uh, without the queen, the hive is basically useless. Do you normally find the queen? I'm about 97% this year. Good. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. And the queen is it's important because she's the only fertile female. Okay. In the spring and summer, we can always raise up a new queen. But in the fall, it's important to find the new queen and right. make sure that she's in there. When we do work from the inside of the house, we open a window. Okay. We actually right. open the shades so there's light on the glass. The bees that come into the house, instead of going all over the house and crazy, they go straight to the window. All nature wants to get out. Sure. And so when they get to the window, we just vacuum them out of the window and they go into a two-stage vacuum. The bees are safe in there. Vacuum. Okay. Vacuum. But the bees are safe. It's a two, right. think uh, sawdust collectors. Okay. You've got the vacuum over here, but you've got your sawdust being collected here. The buckets that I use are basic five gallon buckets. They have eight pieces of plastic foundation Lincoln logged into the bucket. Okay. In the bottom of the bucket is a half inch of foam. Huh. And the bees get sucked into there. They hit the foam, they bounce. They, they have an exoskeleton. Right, right. They're real bouncy. And we can get about twenty to 30,000 bees per bucket. <laughs> wow, <laughs> really? Really, really. 
And in midsummer, those hives, we can leave with three buckets of bees. Wow. And when we're setting up the new hive, we open the bucket and we release the bees back into their hive. It's, a, it's an eviction. Right. It's a, a removal. It's a relocation. But their home smells like home. And so they go right into the box. about that? So let me ask you, you said earlier that some of those bees were sprayed. What happens to bees when they're sprayed with a pesticide? Well, they die. Okay. It's a side, you know? Right. Homicide, pesticide, yeah. right. something's dead. And when the bees are directly sprayed, those will die. But wax is very absorbent. Okay. And a lot of times when people use a can of wasp spray and they spray at a, a hive of bees, mm. that first piece of comb catches the pesticide and stops it and it doesn't enter in the rest of the hive. So the bees don't get killed. They're not like wasps. When people call about bees in a house, they're looking at a small nest. They're thinking wasp. The reality is it can be huge. The first few months that they build in a house, they'll build two cubic feet of comb. Wow. That's man. cubic That's feet. impressive. And that first piece of wax stops the pesticide. And if the bees can find another exit, then they'll use that as their new entrance. I've seen on chimneys where they've been on one side of the chimney, and they sprayed, and the bees now use the other side of the chimney mm. as their entrance, and they build all the way around the chimney. Wow. What kind of experience do you need to be able to remove bees? You need a background in construction. Mm. You need to understand how mm. houses are built. You right. need to know what's behind Good the walls. Point. And you need to know that there are pipes, there's electricity, there are other things in that wall besides bees. And when we work through those walls, I'm always looking for electricity. This is an exterior wall. They could be bringing electricity along the side and down the wall. And when we find the wires, you don't want to cut them. It's not, <laughs> it's not good for us or the bees. Right. God, yeah. And I've, right. I've been in situations where there were nine wires coming through. Oh. <laughs> I've been there with the can lights where the bees have built their comb over and around the can lights and the people's ceilings. You know, on a fireplace, you've got the can lights in the front. It really looks nice inside the house but it makes it difficult in removing the bees because we have to remove all that comb off the wires uh -huh. and off the lights. Right, how about that? So construction, deconstruction. Deconstruction, okay. And making it possible for the homeowners to get that put back together. I like to call it minimally invasive. The smaller the hole, the better for me. Okay, yeah. And the better for the contractor who comes and does the repair. Sure. Have you ever experienced a time where the bees were actually dead that you wanted to remove? Several times. Okay. Uh, How's that? Well, it stinks huh. in, in both ways. Right. It, you're thinking 40,000 bees. Right. One bee doesn't smell bad, but when they're all sitting on top of each other, they start to molder and they smell like a dead dog. Wow. How about it's, that? it's pretty bad. Plus, it stinks because there's nothing to save. Huh. So, I've had situations where the bees have been sprayed and they're all dead, and the honey is leaking down through the walls. It, it just coats through the insulation. It comes underneath the wall, gets into the padding of the carpet. And one house in Germantown, they actually, they knew something was wrong because their floor was squishy ah. and sticky. Okay. And spraying is never a good answer because in the end, you're gonna have a higher cost in the repair because all of that wet stuff has to come out of the house. Wow. If we can get it on the front end before anything gets sprayed, I have little controls that I use to keep the honey from leaking into the house as we remove them. Okay. Catch it, you know, s absorb the honey that's pulled up and get it out. So what happens to the honey though? I mean, does some of that pesticide actually get into that honey, do you think? Well, I'm a, I'm a little nervy when it comes to pesticides. Okay. So if I come to a hive that's been sprayed and I can see in the wax that it's been sprayed, uh, that honey's never saved, it's never sure. used. Uh, I talk with the homeowners and, and ask them if they want some of the honey. If the homeowner is willing to eat the honey, mm. they haven't sprayed the bees. Huh. So that honey can be saved and it can be fed back to the bees or it can be harvested and eaten. Wow. So the, the largest hive I removed had 20 gallons of honey in it. 20 gallons? 20 gallons. Oh my gosh. And think a five gallon bucket, about 50 pounds. That's 200 pounds of honey sitting in someone's ceiling. Yeah, if it falls, the ceiling crashes in. Wow. How about that? It's crazy. That's, David, that's some good stuff, man. We appreciate you coming on the show and sharing that with oh, us. Oh, I love coming back here. We know you do. <laughs> we appreciate it. Green manure.
Yeah, yeah. That yeah. wasn't a lot, right? That's not right manure. Right. I mean, it's, yeah, it's not right yet, no. <laughs> Green manure. Of course, you okay. hear that a lot, you know, in vegetable gardens. You do, you do, very much so. Right. And uh, that is a kind of an old thing that's been around a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Farmers practiced it way back, generations mm -hmm. ago. And it was uh, a, a crop that you would grow that usually was one of the legumes, mm -hmm. which have the nitrogen fixing, you know, ability. Mm -hmm. So what it does is you grow this crop, and it can be a cover crop. You know, a lot of green manure and cover crop doesn't necessarily mean the same thing because cover crops can be not green manures, just cover crops okay. to prevent erosion and things like that, or to break up hard soils. But a green manure crop is grown specifically to grow and turn back into the soil for its manure or nutritive, you know, properties. And it's mainly legumes like clover, um, vetch, hairy vetch right. yeah, hairy vetch, mm -hmm. uh, alfalfa. beans, yeah, alfalfa, alfalfa. exactly. Yeah, sure. You know, bean crops, all of those could be used as uh, green manure mm -hmm. crops. All right, Mike, we're glad to have you on, man. We're no, gonna talk about composting. You know, a lot of people wanna know about composting. A lot of people, believe it or not, are not doing composting correctly. So you're gonna walk us through that process, right? For sure, I'm happy right. to be here. It's good yeah. to see you. Good, yeah, yeah. so I, how do you wanna get started? Oh, well, um, so this is something that we do with demos, uh, and this is sort of uh, a why, a sort of a couple, why are we composting? Okay. And we start right. with why and then, then go to how. Okay. Sure. Uh, so this is sort of a, uh, a, the journey of our food right here, if you will. All right. <coughs> so we start with a, a homegrown tomato right. right there, and that's, <laughs> that's where the whole thing starts as far as composting is concerned, how it hits us. Okay. Uh, and then we've got, uh, good thing this isn't smell vision this is, uh, <laughs> This is day right. one, so we've got some fresh stuff in there. Look at that. And a little caveat on that, uh, that, that would make an unbalanced product right there okay. because there, this is mostly uh, nitrogen. There's very little carbon in that right. right now, and to balance that, we would, we would be adding a whole lot of, of, of carbon to it, and good carbon sources, leaves this time of year. Sure. Uh, sure. Also sawdust, they make friends with a carpenter. Uh -huh. uh, that would help, it, wouldn't it? Yeah, for uh -huh. sure, but you want to watch out for treated lumber there, That's right. uh, and also black walnut, right. because they will affect the growth of some plants. Okay. And if you're growing veggies, that could be a problem. Good deal. And then, <clears throat> so, uh, compost wants a lot of the same stuff that, that we do to be healthy and to complete the metabolic processes. So you're gonna, you want to make sure it's got enough uh, water, moisture content okay. needs to be good, uh, and air, uh -huh. so it needs oxygen to be a good healthy anaerobic. Uh, and I'm glad you mentioned that because a lot of people don't realize that. Yeah, that's, that's true. Air. Yeah, it does. It, yeah, for sure. And it, and it, will, it will for sure uh, decompose <laughs> uh -huh. in, in the absence of oxygen, uh -huh. but good, good healthy compost needs oxygen. Okay. So you want to turn it every once in a while. So this is sort of uh, an example of what it looks like when it's first turned. Um, and you see like the tender greens, like the spinach and all that stuff is gone already. It's already breaking down. Uh, but the more uh, fibrous stuff, you know, like for example, there's a, uh, uh, pineapple top in there uh -huh. and the heavy leaves and, and stuff like that take a little bit longer to break down. You okay. still see, you still be able to recognize those at this point. Okay. And gotcha. then, I'm you know, you so far. <laughs> yeah, few, you know, next, next go around, things start to break down. You see it starting to look more like dirt, oh, yeah. I guess, but you see the sticks are still in there and, you know, the beach leaves and stuff like that, okay. to, you know, oak leaves that take longer to break down. Uh, and then, Right over here is where you start getting into the exciting stuff. <laughs> That's exciting. Uh, yeah, this is this is pretty close to being finished compost right yeah. there, and and you you really it's notice dark. that it starts to starts to it has a different character. It starts to get like looser and lighter, and it smells <coughs> kind of woodsy uh -huh. and and sweet and nice, and and that's sort of where it starts to get finished. So, and then we cure it up at that point, okay. and, and you let it sit, and that's when it sort of really develops the nutrients that 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 you're going to be looking for as a soil amendment. Now, how long would you let it sit? <laughs> uh, well, okay, so this whole process, it depends. Composting is sort of a input in, uh, output, out okay. kind of a situation. So the more you fool with it, if, uh, the faster it's going to break down, do. the, right. the faster you get to a finished product. So if you follow like the University of California method, for example, and you turn it every, every day or two, uh, and, and maintaining a, a consistent uh, moisture level and keeping that oxygenated pile going, uh -huh. uh, you can you can get to this stage here in a couple of weeks. Wow! Uh, sometime. Wow. Uh, we we have a much bigger facility. We're dealing with windrows, so okay. It, it, we're every every couple of weeks we're making sure that we're turning it, especially during the growing season when okay. it's hot. Gotcha. Uh, <clears throat> we get to here generally in about 
maybe two months, three months, okay. and then it sits and, and, good. and cures up and, and uh, in the cure pile for uh, another couple of months okay. from there. Nice. And then you get, uh, yeah. this, is, this is a poor little volu <laughs> volunteer uh, right. that He's I got. He's kind of hanging here. Yeah, he, he, uh, <laughs> I, I picked him out of the garden this morning <laughs> against his will because he was happy where he's at, but he's sitting in some brand new uh, sifted and finished compost. Man, and this that is, looks good. It looks pretty good, that I gotta say. Good. And, and uh, you know, good heavy nitrogen feeder like that, that yes. tomato yes. would love love a lot of that at, at home. Wow. Um, but yeah, that's, this is what, what we're putting uh, back out in, uh, in the world sure. instead of letting it get to the landfill where it's going to going to cause problems instead of, instead of be helpful in, in growing stuff in wow. our home landscape. Some good stuff. Let's yeah. talk about the carbon nitrogen ratio. Okay. Because a lot of us get that wrong. Yeah, that's true. Right. That's right. true. Yeah, it's not a one to one. You yeah, don't yeah look it's not a one to one. Right. Right. one to one. And, yeah. and uh, we were talking about that a little bit earlier. If okay. it smells funky, uh, <laughs> you don't have enough carbon in okay. it. Okay. So right. you want to be adding, right. adding carbon. And, and the, the, the general rule of thumb is somewhere in the, in the neighborhood of 25 uh, to one carbon ratio oh, to nitrogen. Uh, so the, um, you want to be stockpiling those leaves this time of year because they're valuable. And if you're going to be composting in the summertime when there's not a leaf, leaf, leaves available, maybe even, unless you've got a magnolia or something yeah, like something that. Yeah, something like that, right? Um, <laughs> you uh, you want to hang, if you have space for them, it's, it's good to hang on to those so that you can add those as you're, as you're bringing your kitchen scraps and your grass clippings out to the compost pile and adding that nitrogen. Okay. Let's give the folks some examples. What is considered a carbon? Uh, yeah, carbon. So leaves are leaves are like the most readily available source. Everybody's right. got a tree in their yard or in their sure. neighborhood that they can that they can shag it, some leaves from, uh, and don't put them on the side of the road and bash. That's right. right? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. can cut down you on your waste stream. Time. Yeah, right. save right. your leaves. Save your leaves. They're important. Uh, but also sawdust is a great is a great uh, source. Uh, news shredded newspaper is another one that you can get get your hands on pretty sure. pretty easy. You okay. want to stay away from paper that's bleached if you can help it. And you stay away from paper that's been any kind of wax coating okay. Or, okay. or heavy dyes or anything yeah. like that too. But you, you know that's those are those are some fairly easily accessible carbon sources okay. for folks. All right. What about the nitrogen sources? Uh, nitrogen is is greens. Just so any, green. yeah, anything that comes out of your kitchen, for the most part, there's some carbon that's that you're that you're that you're going to be putting in your in your kitchen bucket. Uh, but most of your stuff that's coming out of your kitchen, uh, your your veggie and fruit scraps yeah. and stuff like that, is, is going to be heavy in nitrogen. Okay. Also, grass clippings. Sure. Which are great in the, and they break down sure. super quick too. All right, so we talked about the good things you should put in your compost pile. Uh -huh. What about those things we shouldn't put in? That there? is uh, that that is that's a good good point. It's a question of scale, uh, but in a uh. in a backyard compost situation, right, right, yeah, you absolutely absolutely want to stay away from animal products, mm -hmm. uh, any kind of processed or cooked foods if it came out of a bag or a box. Oh, okay. Probably not yeah. such a good idea to be right. putting it in your compost pile, and anything that you've cooked, uh, you want to stay away from too. Oils. Uh, bones any, anything anything like that um, because the <laughs> that's the difference between healthy compost that's useful in in your environment and a rat farm you, you, <laughs> right. you don't want to be growing rats right yeah you don't want to be doing Memphis that says enough rats yeah we already. got enough we of that we don't, we don't need yeah, any more I'm of those i'm with you on that so yeah that's a that's a that's a great point okay what about scale of the compost pile does it matter i mean it, as a homeowner <laughs> should we start with a smaller yeah pile? uh that's a that's also a great point okay. um there, so there's if you want a, a really hot compost, there's sort of ah, a, there's okay. a there's a critical mass in terms of volume that you want to you, that you're going to be looking at. And okay. That's usually about a, a, a cubic meter, which is a lot if you're thinking yeah. about it, and, okay. and it, may, it could take a while to, to get that. But the, okay. the thing to remember with composting is it's a fairly forgiving art, and, <laughs> and no matter how you do it, within reason, okay. uh, right. you're going to come out with a fairly useful product. Just the it's a, it's efficiency. The more energy put in, the faster it goes. The 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 more you are concerned about uh, properly sized compost pile and your inputs, the the better okay. the nutrient value of, of the compost that you're making is going to going to be. Another thing about that is <coughs> you want to have at least two containers. Okay. Uh, so uh, that so that one can do the the okay. curing. I got right. You. Well, you're starting a second pile because you're not going to stop eating. You're not going to stop mowing your grass, right. and the leaves aren't going to stop falling. That's right. So, so you you need to have a second pile uh, or a second container available, uh, so that this first one can finish doing what it's doing, and then you just flip and start that cycle again. And you Makes can sense. you can do a you can do a, a heap, I guess, uh, in a in a bin on the ground with that soil contact, which I find is helpful because okay. you you have more access to those microbes that are in the ground that are going to be doing the, the decompositional okay, work sense. for us anyway yeah, and, right. and worms and all that sort of other stuff but you can also there are lots of lots of 
containers on the market, yeah, tumblers and all, all, uh, all, all kinds. Um, and, you know, worm, worm bins and, yeah. and stuff like that as well, for sure. Okay. Yeah. All right, we appreciate you coming on and telling us a little bit about composting, well, man, because sure you are the compost fairy. Right? I am the compost fairy. <laughs> yeah, we're serving Memphis, for sure. Ha happy to help uh, with the, the education process. Yes. And, Diverting some of that waste out of the landfill and turning it back into, into some of that good well, stuff. Well, look, over you, there. you're doing a good job, man. Well, so we definitely so do appreciate that. Thanks for being here, all right? Thanks, Chris. I appreciate right. it. We're here in the garden and we've noticed that there's holes in the leaves on our okra. And that's from Japanese beetles. We're going to try to get rid of the Japanese beetles by mixing up some soap water. What happens here is you put a little soap, dishwashing soap, in some water and you mix it up just a little bit for a soapy solution. And then you get your Japanese beetles and you drop them in here and this will uh, eliminate the hormone that's present from them so that other Japanese beetles will not want to be attracted to this area. So you just take your soap, then you're gonna find your beetles, pick them off, and drop them in the soap. And this will take care of them by picking them off and putting them in this solution. All right, so here's our Q&A segment. Y'all ready? Ready. We have some ready. good questions here. Mr. David, you help us out, we get in trouble, okay? Good luck. All right, <laughs> here's our first viewer email. Does imidacloprid hurt bees? And this is from Nanetta via YouTube. Good question. It is, it is a, one that we get all the time. We are glad to have a bee expert here. So what say you? Anything that ends with side okay. is going to kill the bees. Okay. What we have found in studies is the imidacloprid that is that finds its way in the hives causes the bees to become drunk. Okay. It messes with their ability to orient and how to GPS back to the hive. The good thing is Bees that can't find it back to the hive, find their way back to the hive, can't do the waggle dance and tell the other bees where to go mm. to find food. Uh, earlier this year, we had a, the first pan-European study on neonicotinoids, and imidacloprid is one of the neonics. And what they found, if you read the what hits the internet, 60% of the bees died. Mm. But if you dig down in the actual study, you see that the UK, Hungary, and Germany were involved in the study. Germany lost no bees. Mm. The difference between Germany, the UK, and Hungary is Germany went in with strong, healthy hives. The hives that were in the UK and Hungary had disease, they had problems to begin with. Germany also had alternative food sources for mm. the bees to get mm. to. Where UK and Hungary, it was just rapeseed. That's all they had. And if all you're eating is green beans all day long, yeah. your system's gonna get messed up. Germany, because of the alternative food source, the bees that did the waggle dance for the alternate, <laughs> that came back, the bees were able to go and get food. And they survived, they made it through winter. So my, and this is the advice I give to the kids that I mentor, strong, healthy hives. If you don't have strong, healthy hives to start with, you're gonna have problems. Germany is doing that. They went in the study with a strong, healthy hive and there was an alternative food source. So the bees that did the waggle dance told the other bees where to go. Mm. In UK and Hungary, <coughs> That's all they had to get from. And so a starving man with poison apples, eventually he's gonna eat an apple. Mm. And the bees did too. Wow. Strong, healthy hives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And alternative food sources. Alternative food sources, because the, de the bees do the waggle dance. And the ones that are drunk and can't GPS back home, don't tell them where to go. The right. ones that do come home, that's where they go. That's where the next foragers go. So they're gonna go to the other foods. Very good. By good. the way, water's poisonous too to yeah. these. Yeah. It, yeah. And us. Yeah. All right, Miss Nanetta. Good question. Uh -huh. I think we got you a good answer. All right. Here's our next viewer email. There is something eating the leaves of my broccoli. How do I control the pest <laughs> without using hard chemicals? And this is from Mary in Germantown. Something's Ooh. eating the leaves of the broccoli, but guess what? She doesn't want to use any hard chemicals. And, and that's good. And it's very yeah, good. good. And I don't think she has to. No, I don't think you have because, to. Because, I mean, we don't have a picture. Right. And, and, but most likely, 
the culprit is either going to be some kind of worm, yeah. uh, a loper, yeah, something like yeah. that, that will be easily controlled with something called BT, which That's is right. Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a naturally occurring bacteria that gets into the gut of these uh, worms, and it, it kills them, the caterpillars kills them. Right. So. And you can kill them without using the hard chemicals. Right. Right. Because, right. yeah, you're right, it's probably one of the, it's probably a cabbage looper or a cabbage worm. Mm -hmm. Right, and they're feeding on the broccoli. Yeah, if you go ahead and use this uh, BT product, which is Dipel, mm -hmm. that's the name for it. Yeah. Javelin is another name. Um, mm -hmm. It'll do the trick. Yes. Natural occurring organism. So it, it will do the trick for you, Miss Mary. But just remember, when it rains, you're going to ah, have to reapply. Good point. That's a good point. Because good it's, point. it's just washes her off. That's right. <laughs> so you have to reapply. All right. So again, Miss Mary, no hard chemicals, BT. It'll do the trick for you. Well, Miss Joy. Today we're out of time. It's been fun. Thank you. Thank good. you. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplots 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. You can find out more about the things we talked about on today's show on familyplotgarden.com. We also have our past shows if you want to see one again. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.